Recently, I had the opportunity to speak with Jason Bergman, who worked as lead producer on Fallout New Vegas. During our interview, he shared some very interesting memories about the game's development, as well as some previously unknown information about its cut content, and I've been beyond excited to share this with you for a while now. Before we get started, I want to give a very special thanks to Jason Bergman for making this episode possible. Let's get right into it. First, I ask about his role as lead producer on the project. I joined Bethesda in July of 2009 specifically to work on FNV. Until then, there was no dedicated producer on the project. It was what I was hired to do. I actually applied pretty much immediately after they announced it. It was my dream game. We released in October of 2010, which meant we released to manufacturers in September. It was a bonker schedule, and that meant that there was zero downtime. We had to get with the punches every step of the way. My role was to manage the Obsidian relationship, coordinate QA, localization, and VO, and basically approve everything that went into the game. And then, there were all the random little things I did, like design the Meet of Champions perk, and write background dialogue. I asked him to elaborate on the game's development. It's worth mentioning that FNV was an insane development process. It was 18 months start to finish, and the first four months of that were pre-production. It was amazing we came out at all. Final three months of development were bug fixes and scrambling. Scrambling to optimize. PS3 was virtually unplayable until about six weeks before submission. Less than 45 minutes of uptime and 10 FPS. Programmer Frank Kowalkowski pulled some serious last-minute voodoo to make it work at all. That guy is a genius. I loved working on that game. It was completely insane, and I was way over my head a lot of the time, but I consider it worthwhile. To give you an idea of how nuts it was, my work area was in the basement in those days. In between July and September of 2010, I was getting in so early and leaving so late that there was one day I had to go mail a package in the middle of the day, and I looked up and realized I hadn't seen the sun in months. It was wild. I was curious if he was compensated for these insane hours, or if this was yet another example of crunch. Crunch refers to the periods of countless overtime hours that are present in almost every game's development in order to meet a deadline, development milestones, to create a press demo, etc. And because most developers are on a salary, those extensive hours typically go unpaid. Jason replied, Ha! Overtime? Game developers don't get overtime. QA does, but they're on contract. That's the reality of the gaming industry. I've done crunch before and since, but nothing as extreme as FNV again, owing to the insane nature of our schedule. Now it appears that this crunch only applied to certain members of the dev team, as Jason Fader mentioned that he volunteered his time to record the game's temp VO. Recently, I began speaking with New Vegas area designer J.R. Vosvik, who notably created Nipton and Nelson, and he had this to say about the game's crunch. As for crunch, I don't remember it being too terrible, and I had definitely been on far worse at other companies. Obsidian was cool about staff dedicating what time they could, but nothing mandatory. It was after FNV that I decided I wouldn't crunch on games anymore, and just make the time spent as productive as possible. Josh Sawyer spoke about this recently on Twitter, saying, I spoke hastily in the QA session of my talk, saying that Fallout New Vegas was made without crunch. I would say everyone worked overtime on FNV, and a subset of people did crunch in the late project, notably area designers and programmers. As lead producer, I was very curious if he knew why the original version of Ulysses was cut. Jason revealed the answer to a question that I've had for some time now. Ulysses got very far in terms of writing, but none of it was implemented. Avalon wrote an entire script and handed it in, but it was absolutely absurd. Something like 12,000 lines for a single character. We even started recording him. I made the call to cut him because the cost of translation would have been astronomical. At that stage, we had concept art for Ulysses, but that's it. He was never actually put into the game until Lonesome Road. We recycled the idea, but not the actual script as originally written. Now, first of all, I would kill to see that script. It's difficult to even imagine how much lore Ulysses would have spouted about being a tribal, joining the Legion, 
rising to the rank of Frumentari, discovering Hooverdam and the NCR for the Legion. Secondly, 12,000 lines of dialogue sounds like an absurd amount to begin with, but to really put that number into perspective, FNV and all four of its DLCs combined have over 65,000 lines. Now, each one of those 12,000 lines would have had to have been translated into other languages, then recorded for various localizations, so it's not hard to see why it was cut. But, if someone could crowdfund enough money to get Chris Avalon to rewrite his original script, then have those lines professionally recorded by a voice actor while a modding team implements Ulysses as he was originally meant to be, I could die happy. Just saying. In response to this, I mentioned that Cass, who was also written by Chris Avalon, had a significant amount of her dialogue cut. I do remember calling a lot of Cass dialogue. I love Chris to death. I have three favorite RPGs of all time, and one of them is Planescape Torment. The other two are Fallout 1 and Morrowind. Like I said, dream project. But that guy likes to write. It was because of his overwriting that I set a hard limit on how many lines we could record for the DLC. I think it was 1200 across all four. It was a good challenge for them. Chris Avalon actually talked about this dialogue limit in 2012. He mentioned that the limit was 10,000 lines, and he appeared to imply that this limit was responsible for Christine being mute, as well as Dr. O's corrupted voice modulator. I will admit, one bit of trickery I did was, because we had a limited number of voice lines, we started doing things like making some of the main characters mute, so they'd only do like hand gestures and symbols and non-spoken text. We were only able to get away with that for so long. All of these things are important because they're going to save you time when you're recording at the studio. Because studio time is incredibly expensive, and the last thing you want is some actor spending five minutes debating the line with you trying to get it fixed, when you have 300 more lines left to read, and you have no idea how you're going to get it done. Next, I inquired if there was any content that he regretted not making into the final game. The only thing I wish we had gotten in was Cass's romance option. The idea was that you would get drunk and wake up in a marriage ceremony being officiated by the king, who was singing Love Me Tender. I still love that idea. We couldn't get the music rights and ultimately cut her romance entirely. We also at one point had plans for same-sex marriage that we cut out. At the time, that was still a new thing in this country. It wasn't killed because of that, we scaled back romance in general but it's a bummer we couldn't be quite as progressive as originally planned. I am still proud of what we got in though, especially Arcade. It's easy to see why Jason wishes Cass's marriage option had made it into the final game, because this is hands down one of the best cut ideas from the entire game. This isn't even the first time this cut marriage scene was talked about. Josh Sawyer has mentioned it several times over the years. We actually had some ideas for characters that would, like, in one story draft we had, Cass would get drunk with the protagonist, and then they would wake up with the king having married them at the king's school of impersonation. That seemed very Vegas, but we were also like, that's kind of a complicated series of events, so we decided not to do it. But it's also in the vein of the Fallout 2 more humorous romance rather than in-depth and serious. Interestingly, it seems that Chris Avalon wasn't behind these plans, even though he wrote the character. There was never any such cast-slash-king quest-slash-event that I'm aware of. Also, I'm not against RPG romance, I just don't like writing them. Second, it's a shame that same-sex marriage was cut, as that would have been incredibly progressive in 2010. Finally, as Jason mentioned... Arcade was a trailblazer given the time period, and remains as one of the best representations of a gay character in gaming. Josh Sawyer spoke about his inclusion on his blog not long after the game's release, saying, Represent marginalized groups when sensible. Diversity helps broaden the appeal of our media, can add interesting dimensions to thematic exploration, and in some cases may even generate themes that would otherwise go unexplored. Jason continued, Speaking about the game's cut content, I think we got pretty much everything we wanted it in. The Hoover Dam fight isn't as epic as it sounded on paper, and the strip obviously had to be cut up to fit into console memory. 
but we did pretty good, all things considered. Some things I still think are great, like Beyond the Beef, Finster Maker was the writer, I think, and Boone's Quest, Gonzalez. And I love the writing in Honest Hearts to Pieces. When you look at the game's dialogue files, there's gotta be a ton of dialogue that was written and even recorded, but literally never plays. I personally wrote at least a hundred lines of Nightkin dialogue that we recorded, but you'll never see in the game. None of us had ever actually made a game with the BGS engine before. It was my first project at Bethesda, and BGS was busy with Skyrim, so they were of no help. So we thought all characters needed all of those radiant dialogue lines, but there's no way to get most of those to play. Oh well, live and learn. And he's right. I can only guess how much unused recorded dialogue there is in the game files. Simply between the dialogue from cut quests and story events, and the dialogue that can never be played because of impossible conditions or not being randomized, etc. But there are at least hundreds of recorded lines you'll never hear in the vanilla game. I'm pretty satisfied with the content that made it into the game. Everything that was cut was either repurposed, Ulysses, or just reduced in scope. I would have liked to have seen the cast slash arcade romance stuff, but since they never got off the paper design stage, it's barely worth considering as cut content. I was curious if he had a character concept for Wild Wasteland Radio, to which he responded, I remember talks about Wild Wasteland Radio, but there was so much to do that Wild Wasteland was always a nice thing to have in general, and not worth serious consideration. The few things we got in for Wild Wasteland had to be 1. Approved by Illegal, which shot down a lot of ideas, and 2. Very low-hanging fruit. Considering the insane development cycle of New Vegas, it makes sense why there's not much Wild Wasteland content, as it's far from the critical path. Finally, I ask about the relationship between Bethesda and Obsidian. The relationship between Obsidian and Bethesda, at least from my perspective, was great. There weren't many of us on the Bethesda side of the project. Pretty much me, an assistant producer who I shared with other projects, and the QA team, all of who worked like there was no tomorrow. There were frequently tense meetings, but I think we all felt very, very proud of the end result. Any attempts to paint the relationship as strained during development are pure fiction. It was always clear to me that a tremendous amount of effort was put into Fallout New Vegas, but this interview illuminated to me how much time certain members of the dev team sacrificed in order to create the game. While Jason Bergman's transition from a fan to becoming lead producer on the best game in the series, while getting to work alongside some of the team that made the original games is inspiring to say the least, he also created the Meat of Champions perk, which I think is worth mentioning again, as it's one of my favorite perks from any of the Fallout games. And that's all for this episode. I'm saving a handful of this interview for future episodes where those quotes will be more relevant, but that was the majority of what we spoke about. As always, thanks for watching, and like and subscribe for more content like this.